a show about colorful surroundings coming up right after this. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I used to be fascinated by all those colors crammed in a crayon box. I used to love to take those colors and apply them to all sorts of forms and images on paper. Today, as a garden designer, I really enjoy taking color as a principle, a design principle, and painting it across the canvas of gardens. And that's what we're gonna focus on in today's show. I'll show you the results of our mass daffodil planting day and how to create color harmony with summer blooming bulbs. Plus, we'll visit the Coughlin Memorial Gardens in Kansas City. I also have a special guest visiting from England, and I'll give her a tour of my gardens as we discuss color and design. We have a lot of colorful places to explore, so why don't we get started with the deep, rich red tulips that bloomed last spring. exciting if not flamboyant times in my garden in spring is when the tulips bloom particularly these red ones just look at how spectacular these blooms are this variety is called red emperor and it's one of my favorites because of its intense red color now many times people will say I'd love to grow beautiful tulips like these but I just don't have the space or hey my soil is just too difficult to dig in well, the answer is to grow tulips in containers like I've done here. They're a natural. You see, in this big container, I actually planted 100 bulbs. And in these smaller containers, each one of these has 35 bulbs in them. Now, you may ask, how long will these bulbs last? Or I should say, how long will these blooms last? Well, that depends on the temperature. As long as it stays cool like it is today, they're gonna last much longer. But just like with other spring flowering bulbs, you wanna think about the varieties that you choose because they'll bloom at different times in the season. You have early, mid, and late season bloomers. So what I've done here is I've packed in, as you can see, one variety in one container, which will bloom at one time. But just behind these, you'll see other containers filled with later flowering tulips. So I'm extending my tulip time. It's a great way to garden. Several years ago, while touring Castle Hill, a beautiful garden in North Devon, England, I discovered garden designer Zah Tolomash. You see, Zah designed the Millennium Garden there, and when I saw it, I was an immediate fan. Soon after, we became fast friends, and I was delighted when she came to visit the farm for a tour. a garden designer I've discovered that you know using one thing and using it in a broad way painting with a broad brush mm. like a color can make a big difference and I know you're a designer how do you feel about that well I think sometimes they say you know less is more but sometimes you want more and more and if you can have a limited color palette right. like you've got here yeah with just a very uh, like two or three color combinations yes but lots of them it's very effective well here what I tried to do is use that classic Queen of the Night I know you yeah, love that I too love that. she's so dark next to this one called Pink Impression what's here in front of well, it well the lower one's called Christmas Dream and it's just a it's a lower pink it's a peony flowered tulip and then over behind us I was experimenting with two of my favorites Princess Irene which is orange and then Negrita which is purple but that purple is a beautiful Beautiful, lustrous purple, which I've always loved. Now, orange is something new on my radar. Well, what do you think of orange? Because it can be a quarrelsome color. Well, I was such a color snob in the <laughs> olden days. I was. I thought everything pastel and nothing loud that shouted out 
orange was not allowed in my garden. I think your tastes change and now I can't get enough of it. Well, you, you really have to give yourself permission to allow your taste to change. I always say that to my clients, don't you? I mean, I say the expensive mistakes are the design elements, but plants don't cost a lot of money. And have confidence and put something in. If you don't like it, take it out. What I like about that combination of the Tulip Princess Irene and the Greta is if you look at the petal of Princess Irene, it has that same purple in it that you find in the Greta. So you have yeah. that, that harmony going mm. on between those mm. two tulip varieties. And because it might not be a conscious thought that you've picked out the tulip, somewhere in your subconscious, the two mix well. When you plant in your garden, do you think about the home? Do you think about what you want to cut and bring inside certain rooms? No. I like what blooms outside. Anything that I can bring in to enhance the house, then to the good. But I don't plant things to cut. Yes, I see. Do you I cut, I, I raid, the, raid the whole garden. You enjoy bringing things in the house, but no. you don't plant with that in mind. No. You do, obviously, because you've got wonderful pots throughout the house of very careful combinations which do the colors for the room. I, I do pictures. think that in the back of my mind I actually am thinking about rooms. Now yeah. I haven't thought about it that way but as a painter, someone who likes to paint landscapes and things like that, I do think I think about those rooms. Yeah. 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 How interesting. Well thank you for being here today. Oh well it's just a pleasure. We've got a, such a wonderful day. It is a gorgeous day and, and you've made it even better <laughs> by being here. Oh thank you Alan. <laughs>
It's really not, but these are Asiatic lilies. But they have a deep, dark claret color, very deep maroon. So let's say that you're not in the mood for something cool. You want something a little warmer. Well, let me show you on the other side of the garden what we're serving up that's really hot. Come on. Take a look at this. Is this hot enough for you? This is a Crocosmia called Lucifer. Get it? And then back here, look at those really hot screaming oranges. That's a canna called Pretoria. And just look at its variegated foliage. I think it's a real knockout. You see how these warm colors change the whole mood of the garden. These reds call for you to look at them. They really want attention. Some companion bloomers for this warm colored themed garden include Lantana, coral color diasica, and some orange daylilies. Take a look at the color of the leaves of this nine bark and the smoky tones of this bronze fennel. You can see they resonate well with these really hot colors. And take a look at these cannas. They're really kicking it up today. In fact, I'm gonna take some in for a flower arrangement. Of course, if I wanna harmonize with this color, I'm probably gonna to have to go in and change my shirt. Ooh, this is a pretty one here too. I enjoy visiting different gardens around the country. And this past summer, I was in Kansas City, Missouri, where I took a tour of the beautiful Kaufman Memorial Garden. Julia, the first time I came to Kaufman Garden, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I fell in love with it and have been back since. Does this really represent your parents' expression? Well, I think it does because uh, after they passed away, the Kaufman Foundation's board felt that this would be a wonderful way to reward and give back to our city. Well, what a gift. It is such an intimate and tranquil place. It is beautiful, and we made sure that it would have fountains because Mrs. Kaufman so loved fountains, and Mr. Kaufman put in many fountains at the ballpark. So we commissioned a local artist to do our beautiful statuary somewhat to represent ballerinas, because yeah. Mother loved the ballet so. Oh, I see, I wondered about that. Yes. Well, it's the beautiful dancing on the water. That's right, dancing on the water. And of course, Kansas City is so well known for its gorgeous fountain, so it had to have a water feature Absolutely. here. Absolutely. So I think we have four fountains, and we have the surprise garden in the back. Wayne, this is one of my favorite garden rooms here at Kaufman Gardens. I mean, these water jets are just fantastic. Well, you know, it's probably one of the visitors' most favorite rooms also. They come back in here, <laughs> and it's quite fun because you can hear when someone sees these fountains for the first time because you hear squeals of delight <laughs> wherever you're working out in the garden. It's like, oh, they just heard, they just saw the fountains go. What I love about this garden is that there's so many moments of inspiration. You, you look around and you go, you know, I could apply this idea to my own backyard. And I love a garden like that. Well, I think that's kind of the way we had it designed because there are the five different small garden rooms within our garden here. And in this area here is the secret garden and it's back behind the building so most people didn't expect to find garden with these three wonderful fountains. The repetition of the forms of the plant materials used to carry you through the garden have right. also been important in here. Well, I think that makes a garden feel larger than maybe it actually is, don't you think? I think it does expand the space just by having that same repetition. thing down, down yes. the path a little further. So tell me, Julia, how is the orangery used? Well, the orangery, besides being used for our gardenias and perishable plants in the yeah, winter. the reason for having an orangery. To... But we also have used it for entertaining. We use it sometimes for the staff. And uh, also we've had photographs, wedding photographs, oh, and a marvelous. number of different things that have gone on inside there. What, what a beautiful legacy to leave the people of Kansas City. It's just really remarkable. Well, the most wonderful thing about it is not only the beautiful legacy, but the reward, because people are so thrilled with it, and we get so much feedback, and they have such enjoyment that it's truly been a pleasure. Well, it's quite an inspiration. Keep up the good work. And we're thrilled to have you here, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you.
<laughs> well, it looks like our bales of straw are holding. You know, when you build a house, any kind of construction, you've got to deal with runoff. So what I did here is we dug a trench, uh, the width of these bales of straw, and we buried them about six inches. So we basically created a dam that runs the full length of the house here. So what we've done is we put these batter boards out here. These batter boards help establish the exact coordinates of the footprint of the house on the lot. We're making some progress. These two guys in four and a half days have done all of this. And what we've done here is we've gotten the footings dug and most of the footings are poured. And you can see that we've got that number four half inch rebar coming up every four feet all along the foundation here. And take a look at this wall. You see how it steps down? What you wanna do with a foundation is you wanna make sure that at every level, it is level and it steps down. Hey, the work is continuing. We're getting the flooring in and we had to get our termite inspection and we had to get this thing sprayed for termites. We got the flooring system in. What's really great about it, it feels like a really solid foundation and the reason it does is because we got all the floor joists in on the right centers and so we started with a really solid foundation. But I am so excited because we have now the front wall of the house. Oh, well, almost done. So this is the front door. What do you think? Looking like a house, isn't it? getting pretty excited about it. Well, we've got a floor plan and we're beginning to lay that out. When you walk in the door here, immediately to the left, we'll have a staircase and it's got to clear this window over here. What we've done is we've we've put in the walls, the exterior and the interior. If you look above, you'll see that we have a ceiling coming in. That's actually the second floor floor joist. He's got all of those laid out, except for just a few where the staircase is coming up. And when you step out onto the staircase, you can see how level the floor is. It's really exciting. You know, it's always enjoyable when you email pictures of your house. I can ponder some ideas that maybe will help you improve the landscape. Now, today we're looking at a contemporary house in Michigan. It's owned by Lynette. Now, Lynette is struggling with the fact that this house faces the north and she really can't get much growing in her flower beds because of that lack of light. But I think that there's some things that can happen here that would really make this garden, this front garden more attractive. One thing, Lynette, if, if you would, I would love for you to consider making the bed larger, pulling it out away from the house. But I think it would loosen the composition to sort of bring it out here and come around, make this much broader and then sweep around to the side. And by pulling this around here, we could almost plant a Japanese maple tree here, which would be very beautiful. Now, I want you to think about limiting your plant palette. So if we narrow it down to hydrangeas and azaleas for some shrubs, um, and let's just go with that for just a moment. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do a big mass planting of azaleas here. I want them kind of underneath this tree, and then we'll bring some azaleas over here because they're evergreen. And then I want you to think about another small Japanese maple, a dwarf variety right here on this corner, like this. And then maybe you bring some of those azaleas down here. Another mass planting of them. When I say mass planting, I'm talking about five to seven in a big group. And then if we filled in with some hydrangea uh, here, it may require moving some things around. And then behind this Japanese maple, some hydrangea, 
and then hydrangea repeating it, then hydrangea down here. See how I'm using big, bold masses of the same thing? And then under here, then we could come in with some perennials like hostas. And so what I would do is start back here in the back with some big hosta plants behind here, some hosta plants here, and some hosta plants in here, and then followed by some ferns and then bring the ferns in across the front here. Again, big drifts, ferns here, some ferns here and over here. You wanna repeat those same plants and then make room for some color, a splash of color across the front, like a drift of impatience, like those little double impatience. So think about all your azaleas being white, all of your impatience being white, uh, your hydrangeas could be a soft pink, which would be beautiful with the brick, or they could be white. And then these Japanese maples, when they leaf out in the spring, they're gonna have that beautiful red color. Anyway, Lynette, here are just a few basic ideas for you to consider. You've got a beautiful place, good luck to you. flower arrangement, I follow a few basic principles. You know, flower arranging really isn't that difficult. And I'll tell you, I like to use as much around the house that I can find as possible. And anything you don't have, you could pick up at a florist or even the grocery store. So what I'm trying to do here is create a model centerpiece. I'm gonna do two of them actually to go on the dining table. And the idea is I wanna keep it pretty low. So I don't wanna go over, say, um, 12 to 14 inches high. So what I started with was some of this floral foam. And what I did is I soaked it in water for about three hours to make sure it was fully hydrated. And then I just took some floral tape and taped that down. And what I'm up to now is just kind of getting the form, using greenery to, to kind of get this thing started. I just added a little magnolia that I gathered. This is Little Gem Magnolia. I'm using some camellia. You can see some of the camellia in here with this leaf, nice glossy leaf. And then a flower that I bought, I bought some euphorbia and I also bought some hydrangea because they're out of season for me here. But I thought the colors worked really well. I've been out in the garden and gathered a lot of tulips. So basically what I'm going to do is go all green with a little chartreuse and then use as many of these sort of apricot and orange and yellow tulips as I can to fill this out. Now with the greenery in place, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work in some of these hydrangeas. And I'm gonna use three of them and do kind of a triangle here in this piece. And now it's time to add some color with these tulips. Now what I like to do is, you can see I've got three different types of tulips here. What I do is take one variety and equally distribute it around the arrangement. So once I've established the length that I need to fill in with these tulips, I can cut them all off at roughly the same length. Because remember, I don't want this to stick up too high. Now the colors that I've chosen really I think work well with the room. So that's why I chose these apricots, slightly orange and some yellows here to really make it pop. The idea is to just equally distribute all the colors. Now I'm adding the last color, which are these beautiful yellow tulips. They're gonna really make the arrangement shine. And I've got to get a move on it because I've got guests coming soon. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed our time together as much as I have. Hey, the thing to remember when it comes to color is to go for those colors that you really love and get creative. Until next time from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.